Mike and I started way back in 1998, and at that time I thought, let's find a Bible story that we could do as like a 45-minute film. We looked at uh, Noah's Ark, and it's chock full of animals, and the fur would have killed us. And then we looked at Jonah. Thought, okay, got water. We'd have to figure out water, which is tricky, but at least there's no fur. Whales aren't furry, so that's better. Going into it initially, my thought was just uh, telling a story using the pirates who don't do anything. He had come up with the concept of, of placing it within a, a contemporary framework. And he was on page 17 and still hadn't gotten to the story of Jonah. And that was when we thought, you know, maybe this wants to be a movie script. We started working on some of the character development in 99, but we just knew as a studio we needed to build a bigger team. So we put it on the shelf for about a year before we started production. And then in mid-2000, thought, okay, you know, now it's time to really move forward on this. And it took about two years to actually produce the film. Jonah? Huh? You are a Jonah. You know me? Of course I do. You are the most famous prophet in the whole world. It took us a while to figure out who should be Jonah. Uh, I thought about Archibald early on, but he was he's not a huge star in the veggie universe. We thought, wait a minute, this is a feature film. It has to be one of our huge stars. So then we thought about Larry. Uh, Larry, no, he, he doesn't get uptight. Then we thought about Bob. Bob gets uptight, but that could work. But because the film ends with him not learning anything, we didn't feel good about Bob not learning anything. Uh, and then we actually looked at Junior at one point. Could Junior be Jonah? And uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. So then we were down to looking at, you know, Jimmy Gord, who, because he talks like this, does not have a huge emotional range. And then we ended up right back at Archibald again. He told me to go to Nineveh, but I didn't listen. You know, I don't like those people. Ooh, these slappers. When we first wrote the the original ending for Nineveh Repenting, Paw Grape was the king of Nineveh. But when we put it up on boards and, and watched it through in context with the rest of the film, it just didn't work. It's like, well, what's Paw Grape doing back there? And so from that, we went back and rewrote uh, the whole ending from where Jonah approaches Nineveh up until when... Nineveh repents. You reintroduce the pirates back into the story, you know, as the, the winner of the, the sweepstakes, which made us then have to go back early in the script and add those, you know, the sweepstakes elements into the beginning of the film and, and all of that. So there was a fair amount of, you know, tweaking that we had to do because of that. Next up, Tarshish, I'll hoist the mainsail. I'll get the boys towelettes. We're in an old Woolworths building in the middle of Lombard, Illinois. And uh, we took it over. We've got our own escalators. They don't work. They're broken. But we got escalators. But then we also have things like some electrical issues because a Woolworths wasn't really laid out with the kind of electricity you need for 500 computers. And also we were just packed in like sardines here. We were bringing in lighters and we were sending people up in hallways. And we have a restaurant next door to us that keeps smoking us out of the place. So we've had to evacuate the premises, oh, I don't know, three or four times during the making of this film. But when you walk in, it's warm and it's happy and it's creative and you see artists working together. So it, it really has been interesting to make a movie entirely in a mall. But would it appear that we've done it? That was easy. It is very difficult to make limbless vegetables funny. We do have to take on the role of being an actor. We really do, and it is challenging without arms and legs. Our animators have really become experts in highly nuanced facial expressions. Some of them don't even move their own arms and legs anymore. They try to do everything with just their eyes. In a live action shoot, the actor doesn't have to think about where to put their eyebrows. That all happens naturally. With the animator, we have to understand what does the body do when it's communicating that? Does the head look down? Does it look to the side? There are a lot of scenes where you see this happen. In the ship's hold, when he's first met Khalil, there's dialogue in the belly of the whale. You'll see Jonah just do some searching. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Neither do I. Because we love our jobs here so much, uh, we always take our work home with us. And I'm always sketching, even while I'm watching TV or playing with my kids, I'm always thinking of ideas of what I can do. So I'm working on the design of the pirate ship, and I'm trying to impress my son, you know, look at this Spanish galleon. He looks at it, oh, this is cool. He starts drawing with his magic marker. He's looking at mine, he's drawing, he's looking at mine, he's drawing. I'm looking at this, he's got, he's got like a baseball bat in there, and he's got a, a mitt and a glove and all the stuff that he loves. He's got in his drawing. And that's when we start to think, we should have fun with this set and start bringing baseball uh, mitts and gloves and, and sporting equipment. And they even had a little dartboard on there. Oh, the dartboard on there. Now, the sad thing is I didn't give him any credit. 
Designed the visual development for the whale. Originally, we were actually thinking the whale was going to be a little more menacing. The whale was going to be really scary. Because I don't know what we were thinking. We were thinking crazy thoughts. So uh, all of our early development for that, we actually threw away because it was too scary for, for the kids. So, okay, we know we want to stay away from this being real scary. So we're coming up with ideas where the whale is really a big goldfish with a smile. But we had another idea where the whale is actually looks just like Archibald Asparagus. And he goes up to Archie and he's got a little monocle on his face. He goes, hello, interchanging back and forth. So then we have the whale looking like a goldfish. We have the whale looking like trout. We just made it, you know, happier and, and you know, nicer looking. And actually, you know, kind of it took on the attributes of sort of a friendly dog. So a big, big yellow friendly dog. With a live action film, you know, you need a, a Coke bottle, you, you get a Coke bottle, you shoot it, and there it is. But with 3D, you actually have to you know, construct and model that bottle. So there's so much attention put into detail of just the little things that, you know, you hardly see on screen at all at times. If you look at the deck of the pirate ship, if you look at the scene of the boat, you know, coming out from the harbor, and then the, the work of the lighters on top of that, you know, some of those shots took days to light. One shot took close to a month, I think, for an artist to light. And then the effects guys who are doing water, you know, and CGI water is still really, really hard. And we wrote our own software. We really could create water that behaved like water did realistically but had uh, a stylization to it that could have kind of more friendly cartoony feel to it. Anything where you saw the water was tough because everything was affected by the water. So whatever the water was doing would affect the boat. And then anything on top of the boat was affected by the water. Khalil was um, very, very difficult to cast. Finding that right person to really fit that character came down to two final people. One of them was Mike, one of our directors, and the other one was Tim Hodge, who's the head of our story department for the film. Final decision was Tim. Tim was a really great contrast for that, and he got across to motion very, very well. You're sitting you know, inside a, a little sound studio, and you have to place yourself on the deck of a pirate ship in a rolling storm, and then talk like you're there. You're going over logs and, you know, bumpy ground and rocks, and so, you know, so you're screaming, but yet you're, you're, you know, your voice is being affected by the bouncing up and down of the band. Mike was writing it, he'd say, we just need, you know, the pirates to ad-lib. And Mike and I both kind of enjoy that. That's, ooh, okay, let's just make up stuff. Oh, the napkin guy. Yeah, you know, he used to fold naps. When Junior sees the, the pirates behind the divider, none of that was scripted. We probably recorded, you know, 10 minutes of bantering with all of those characters and then went back in and, you know, just picked out some stuff to make it as funny as possible. Come on, wake up! like for a while the movie would not get done um it was about uh two months two and a half months before it was supposed to finish and we were having a very hard time uh, getting things rendered you know and that's when all the work is basically done but the computers have to calculate draw the actual pictures so they can go out to film we actually employed people you'll see in the credits as render sleuths uh people who would go in and try to find out what's wrong with this picture we rented a dead store that was right behind you had to go behind the dairy queen to get to it and run fiber optic cable all the way across the mall to wire up 200 more render boxes so we could finish the film on time we also had to bring in about 12 or 13 temporary lighting artists and they were people who had just come off of either ice age or jimmy neutron the scariest worst time was when a lighter said well i haven't seen my shots for two weeks this doesn't look good and the shots actually were being sucked up by the render farm and going to this abyss over here somewhere it was about 45 days of just total chaos many people doubt it I, I didn't I didn't doubt. I knew it was going to be a, a lot of hard work. We've done it with a very small, intimate crew here. Their passion, their talent is something I've never experienced before. Um, it has been a difficult, hard road to get through Jonah. And with that, they've been the most kind, loving people. There's nothing better in the world than feeling like you've been a part of something that will change people's lives. That's the, the wonderful miracle and blessing of working here, that I've got a film uh, you know, that says God wants to, us to give a second chance to everyone. 
and that's an incredibly great message, something I need to learn every day. I hope that the audiences that have seen it will take away the message of compassion and mercy, especially in our, in our age that we live in right now. So much has happened in the world since we began you know, the journey of Jonah that it all seems almost predestined that this story is to come out right now at this point in time in history. It really was the tenacity and the commitment of the people who made Jonah that I remember the most. Uh, they believe in the message of Jonah, they believe in the project, they believe in the big idea, and uh, they made the movie possible. They just worked incredibly hard, sometimes around the clock, uh, to get a film out there you know, that can have a huge positive impact on kids. And I'm, I'm just really proud of the team that put it together. We had so many obstacles to overcome, and just the will and the, the desire and the heart of the people that went into making it, I just am really proud of, of that achievement. I can't believe how hard people worked to get it done, how much they sacrificed because they believed in it so much, so much more than just making a film that's supposed to make a buck. You know, we made a film that's supposed to make a difference, and that's a whole different ball of wax.